welcome back. Hi. Claire, what was your school like? Well, I went to school in the country. It was a school just for girls. We worked really hard. What about you? I went to a mixed school in London. I didn't like the teachers very much, but the facilities were good. Schools are different all over the world, and today we're going to visit a school in Florida, in North America. This is Wellington High School near Palm Beach. Let's meet some of the students and find out about the school. Hi, my name is Jennifer. I'm 13 years old and a 9th grader here at Wellington. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm 15 years old and I'm a 10th grader here at Wellington High School. Wellington High School is the largest high school in Palm Beach County. There are 3,122 kids. Classes start at 7.30 in the morning and finish at 2.40 in the afternoon. Each class lasts 50 minutes. Nine. One of the things I like about Wellington is that we get to study a lot of interesting subjects. I study math, science, Spanish, marine biology, art. German and French and Latin. Um, you can study drama, music, chorus, band. Lunch starts at 11.20. We could have tacos from Taco Bell or pizza from Pizza Hut. And there's also a main course or a main meal that we have every day. We have a lot of sports such as basketball, football, softball, baseball, soccer. I like most of my teachers and I think they do a good job to give us a good education and make class interesting. School is great. The class subjects are really interesting and there's sports team and clubs you can join. The food's okay and I guess the teachers are okay too. I'm not really very fit. I don't really like jogging anyway. It's boring. But there's lots of other sports you can do. No, squash is very tiring. Hmm. Not today. 
Maybe. Hmm. I like tennis. This is Lucy. She's a good tennis player. Sometimes she and her coach Sue practice before school. Um, what we do to start with is we'll just do a quick warm up. So if you'd like to just follow me round, okay? Yeah. Well done. I have two individual lessons and two squads a week and then I have matches and tournaments at the weekends. Right, back it up. Yep, very good. That's it. Well, I like going in the summer to all the tournaments in the weeks. I like the coaching. I mean, it's a fantastic sport, and it's a sport you can play for life. I mean, there's some sports, like that's football, you're not going to play when you're 50, 60. Whereas tennis, something you can play until 70 or 80. And sort of internationally, I mean, you can go to any country and play the game and meet no end of friends. So socially, there's an awful lot of advantages. That's it. Good. All right. My aim this year is to do well in the under 14 nationals in August and then I want to finish my education, do my A levels and then work with tennis, I want to work with children. This is Samir, he's a good diver, he goes diving in the evening so sometimes he gets up early to do his homework before school. Now, what you going to have? Family tea. Have a, have what, what cereal you want? <laughs> he did them himself. <laughs> taught him how to. Can I taught him how to. Can you pass the toast, please? Have you got a uh, training tonight, Samir? Yeah, 5.30. All right, we'll come straight home then after school. I started diving when I was about six and a half, seven. We dive on Wednesday for two hours and then we dive on Thursday for one hour and a half and on Monday we do trampolining. Okay, Smith. At the moment I'm preparing for the national championships in Edinburgh. I'm hoping to get in the top six. Well, you need good gymnastic ability. Obviously, a body that's fairly short often helps because a child will spin it more easily. Um, but most of all, good coordination and obviously no fear. You can choose what, any dive you want to do, but it's better to do harder dives because you just like get more marks.
did okay in the national championships. I came second and I got a silver medal. Just 50 kilometers from Miami is Biscayne National Park, a paradise of sea, islands, coral, and wildlife. The park is almost 74,000 hectares, and 95% of it is in fact water. There are 32 islands in Biscayne, and these are called Keys. They stretch almost 240 kilometers to the south. So, how did they get here? Well, over a long period of time, millions of years in fact, the sea level constantly rises and falls. During colder periods, the ice caps at the North and South Pole get bigger. They use up the water from the rest of the planet. During warmer periods, the ice caps melt and the sea level rises. In fact, a hundred thousand years ago, the sea level was eight meters higher than it is today. Now, when the sea level was much higher, formations of coral grew underwater. When the sea level dropped again, the coral died. And that created the keys or islands you now see here. These reefs are home to an incredible variety of fish and mammal. Let's go and find some. Just beneath the surface of the water are long lines of coral. They are called coral reefs. Now when you look at the coral, it may look like rock, or maybe even a kind of plant. But in fact, coral is alive. It's made up of colonies of thousands of tiny animals called polyps. There are about 50 different types of coral here, and they grow very slowly, sometimes less than a centimeter per year. There are thousands of different kinds of fish here, including rays, and of course, sharks. There are also several types of mammal that live on the reefs. Turtles were here when the dinosaurs were on Earth. These turtles weigh about 160 kilos. These reefs and the wildlife which inhabit them are under serious threat, but not from each other. As usual, the biggest threat is us. Thank you. 
I'd like to welcome everyone to Everglades National Park. Uh, my name is Steve. Um, earlier today, I found something very valuable. Now, this thing didn't come from a living creature, but it's probably the most valuable thing on this planet. What do you think I found this morning? Any ideas? What do you think is the most valuable thing on this planet? Gold. Gold? This thing is probably more valuable than gold. Water. Water. Why is water so valuable? You need water to live. You need water to live. Not just us, but all the animals, and even all these plants that we see around us, need water for their survival. Now, during the wet season, which is the summertime here in South Florida, it rains almost every day. It rains. A lot of water is coming to South Florida. But then the rainy season stops, beginning of December, and it will start drying up. Perhaps the strangest aspect of the Everglades is its flatness. The highest point is just six meters. quicksand in this shallow water? Uh, no, there isn't any quicksand in the Everglades. Does anyone live in the Everglades? In Everglades National Park, nobody is allowed to live in. But just north of the park, in the, uh, the Everglades ecosystem, there are the Miccosukee Indians. Just over a hundred years ago, government soldiers drove them into the Everglades. They built wooden canoes and learned to live here. If you look around, you can see um, what does live here. We have the cypress trees, the dominant tree species here. We have plants that are growing on these cypress trees. The Everglades is very fragile. The greatest danger of all is man. We can both preserve and destroy the beauty of what you see around you. That is why it is very important that we preserve the ecosystem here.
1,400 years ago, they didn't have videos. They didn't have books. And they didn't have cars. This is West Stowe. It's a reconstructed Anglo-Saxon village. That means Anglo-Saxons lived in small villages just like this. They call this period the Dark Ages. That's because we don't really know very much about it. But in fact, thanks to archaeology, we now know quite a lot more. For example, when archaeologists started digging here, they found some very old things, much older than the Anglo-Saxon period. They found axes and tools which are 10,000 years old. They found arrowheads and daggers which are 4,000 years old. They even found a skeleton from the Iron Age. With the skeleton they found a shield and a knife. They also found some Roman coins. The Anglo-Saxons came to England in about 400 AD. They came from Northern Europe and they travelled up the rivers to places like this. They built this village about 420 AD. But how did they live? Alan Baxter is head ranger here. Perhaps he can tell us. So Alan, how did they organise the village? Well, the archaeologists tell us that the houses were in groups of about seven or eight mm -hmm. around each hall. Well, we know that most of the people who lived here were farmers. Mm -hmm. We know that they grew crops, that they kept animals like uh, pigs and cows and sheep. They even had cats and dogs here and also plenty of chickens. We know that because we found the bones. They had to make everything that they needed themselves. So they did a bit of metalworking. They made their own pots and they were very, very good at making things out of wood and making their own clothes here as well. So life was very different in the Dark Ages. No school, no electricity and no aeroplanes. And they wore very different clothes. No, they didn't eat chocolate. They hunted for their food. Don't worry, Oella. It's okay. It's just a bad dream. Um, My name's Nadine. I live with my family in northern Sydney. There's my father, my mother, my sister Kalida, and my brother Saxon. This is my great aunt and my grandmother. They're looking at old family photos. Your wedding. Yeah, and that's Noel. Doesn't he look handsome? 
And all the girls look beautiful. Mm -hmm. I didn't marry him for his looks, actually. <laughs> he was just good-mannered. This is going on a picnic somewhere, and um, it was just after the war. We used to swim there quite a bit, didn't we? And meet the boys there. And meet the boys there. So those were the days. Yeah. And very interesting, really. And when we used to be slim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, that's me. I know that my ancestors came to Sydney a long time ago, but I don't know much about the history of Sydney. Maybe I should find out. Hi, thank Hi. you. Um, do you have any books on the history of Sydney? Yes, we do have some. It's just over at the front. Do you want me to come down or can you go oh, there? Oh, no, I'll be right. Yeah, it's just down the front. I have this one, please. Oh, oh terrific. It's a good one. Yeah. Mm. That's 1795, thanks. People from Europe came to live in Australia at the end of the 18th century. Many of them were prisoners and they came here for punishment. Conditions on the ships were dreadful and many of them died on the way. In 1788, a ship called the Friendship arrived. On it was a man called Anthony Rope. On another ship that arrived at the same time, was a woman called Elizabeth Pulley. They met and got married a few months later. They are my ancestors, and I am their great, 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 great granddaughter. When they arrived, they found that Australia was very different from England. The people who lived here were native Aborigines. Unfortunately, the settlers brought diseases with them, and many Aborigines died. At first, life was very difficult, but soon the area, we now call Sydney, began to develop. In 1851, they discovered gold west of Sydney. Many people came here, hoping to make their fortune. In 10 years, the population of Sydney almost doubled to 96,000, and it continued to grow in the 20th century. In 1926, they built the Sydney Underground, and in 1932, they built the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Sydney now has a population of over three and a half million people. You can still see many of the old buildings, but there are lots of new ones. I think it's a great city. the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge. Every year scientists travel from here to Antarctica. Sometimes they stay for several months. What do they eat? What do they wear? Let's go and find out. The different clothing depends on the, on the weather. 
Um, if it's very cold, then we have to wear a big suit like this if you're working on a boat. Or if you're outside and it's cold or it's snowing or raining, then you have a, a waterproof suit like this to keep you dry. This sort of hat's very good because your ears get cold and you need something to cover your ears. So this goes right over, right over your head. When it's very cold and you have to stand on the ice, we have these special boots. And these have very, very thick soles. They're very thick. Um, the soles are about that thick, which keep your feet <laughs> away from the cold ice. 98% of Antarctica is ice. It's the coldest continent on Earth. The lowest temperature in the world was here, minus 89 degrees Celsius. It's also a very windy place. In some places the wind speed is around 68 kilometers an hour most of the time. It is cold, but um, it's perhaps not as bad as you think because it's quite a dry cold. The sun shines, well, when it's not bad weather, um, you get 24-hour daylight, um, so you can see the sun for a lot longer than you would here. The food's not that great really, it's all dehydrated. We do eat a lot of chocolate. That's one of the plus points of the job, you get free chocolate. <laughs> well, we start off the day with some, usually for your breakfast, mm -hmm. um, and also lots of things like dried fruit, lots of energy, peanuts again, lots of energy, um, spaghetti, pasta, mm -hmm. lots of energy again, yes. um, and little biscuits, biscuits. instead of bread and because we can't make bread and this is dried meat just mix that with water yeah. when we work out in the field away from the base then this is the sort of food that we eat Antarctica is very important because it influences the world's climate the difference in temperature between the equator and the north and south poles helps to circulate the earth's atmosphere Antarctica is a very important place because it's so far from um, the rest of the world. It's isolated and it's not polluted. And it's really beautiful as well. Good morning, 7 o'clock, time to get up. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. This is a PGL centre set in the, in the heart of Shropshire. Come on, lads, let's go and get some breakfast. The centre was open between early March and late November, and uh, we can look after 600 8 to 13 year olds here. Good morning everyone. Morning. Right, this morning we're going to be doing abseiling and then we're going to have lunch and then we're going to be doing canoeing this afternoon at about 2.30. Okay, any questions? Yes? What time's lunch? Lunch is at 12.30. Yes? We're going pony trekking. No, we're going to go pony trekking tomorrow. 
Right, let's go. There are many, many activities here on site. We do abseiling, we do canoeing, we do open canoeing on the river, we do pony trekking. You ready? Yeah. Here you go. Can you still breathe? Yeah. I think the best things are the activities because you get a lot to do and it gets you out a lot and the weather's nice for it and so it's a lot of fun. It's just really fun and all the people are friendly. The best thing is my parents aren't here. The beds are really comfy and the food's really good. It's better than school dinners and um, it's a really nice place to come. What did you do this morning? Oh, I did kayaks this morning. Is it good? It was good, but I fell in. Is the water cold? Yeah, it was freezing. One, two, three, big jump. Swing your leg over. Excellent. The children get an awful lot out of it because they, they, they sometimes come away from home for the first time and they learn a little bit of independence and they also gain enormous experience at working in, in, as part of a team learning new activities and, and sports and things. This is London. I live here and for many years I never went to other cities or countries in Europe because they're a long way away and I don't like airports and I don't like boats. But now, thanks to the Channel Tunnel, I can go to Paris or Brussels very easily by train. It's now 9.30 in the morning. In four hours I'll be drinking coffee by the Arc de Triomphe. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'd like a day return to Paris, please. Certainly. What train would you like to travel on, sir? The 10.23. OK, and when would you like to come back, sir? 8.07. Lovely. How would you like to pay for that, sir? A uh, credit card. Okay. Thank you. If I could just have your card, please. There we are.
journey to Paris by Eurostar takes about three hours, and the train travels at up to 300 kilometers an hour. In a minute, we're going to enter the Channel Tunnel. It's 50 kilometers long, and it takes about 20 minutes to go through it. Bonjour, we're now in France and the time is five past one. This train can carry about 800 passengers. Why are they going to Paris and do they like traveling by Eurostar? I'm going to meet a friend I went um, to school and college with. I'm going on holiday for about five days. I'm traveling on Eurostar today to go across to a business meeting I have with a client in Paris. I love taking the train. I try to take the train as much as possible. I mean, you get to see a lot of the countryside. Uh, it's quick, very convenient, and I think it's uh, definitely better than um, catching, uh, well, taking the plane. The way that Eurostar helps my business is that it makes Europe much more accessible for me to get in, to, to meet people, and also for people to come and see me. I think that's the Eiffel Tower. Hmm, j'adore Paris. Au revoir. play a musical instrument. If you want to be good, you have to practice a bit. Today we're going to meet some young musicians. They come from all over the world and they study at the Yehudi Menu in school. The Yehudi Menu in school is in a little village in Surrey, which is about 22 miles south of London. But we're here to give the opportunity for gifted young musicians to develop their talent. And the young musicians that we train are string players and pianists. Well, the international range of the school is something like 18 different nationalities at the moment. We have obviously still something just about 50% from the UK, but otherwise we have students from Europe, many countries in Europe, uh, also from the Far East, that's Korea, Japan, Taiwan, the People's Republic of China.
My name is Natalie. I'm 12 years old and I come from Suffolk in England. Okay, uh, my name is Alexander Sitkovetsky. I come from Moscow in Russia and well, I play the violin and I'm 13. I'm Maya Fkami and I come from Japan and I'm 13 now. My name's Carmen and I'm 13 and I come from Cheltenham. We get up at 7, breakfast's at 7.30. At 8 o'clock we always have practice uh, until 9 and then we have a meeting. And from then on until 12.45 we have different kinds of lessons. We'll have, let's say, on a Monday maths or English or maybe French with practice in between as well. Half the day is music and half the day is academic work. <laughs> The school is not a school for rich children at all. Music is not a gift to those who are rich, it's a gift to anybody. And it's very important that the school is able to give those children the opportunity to develop their musical talents. Well, we do about 100 to 120 concerts a year. And that includes internal concerts here where we're performing to each other, really. Otherwise, we're doing concerts throughout the UK and, of course, tours overseas, Switzerland, Israel, the States. The school's been to China and we're constantly looking for places to go to. It's very easy to make friends, there's lots of different people here and it's nice because you get to hear all these different languages and it basically widens your knowledge. Um, you get to meet people from other countries and everyone's really nice here. To use this kettle, you need electricity. Electricity is very important in our lives. We use it for all sorts of things. But did you know you can make electricity from steam? And that's what they do here. This is Sizewell B, Britain's most modern nuclear power station. It's actually quite simple to produce electricity through nuclear power. In a nuclear power station, you start with an atom. 
In fact, it's a uranium atom. Everything's made up of atoms, even you and me, and they're very small. Now, when you split an atom, it starts a process where lots of things happen. This is called a chain reaction, and this chain reaction produces a lot of heat. The job of a nuclear power station is to transform this heat energy into electricity. So, how do they do that? Well, first of all, they use this heat to boil water and produce steam, just like my kettle. This steam then drives what's called a turbo generator. These are turbo generators. They're very big and very noisy. The energy in the steam turns these turbines like a huge fan. The turbines drive the generator and the generator produces electricity. Power cables then take this electricity to the people who want it. This is the control room, where they make sure that everything is running properly and safely. Bye. This is Gordon, and he can tell us some more. Gordon, what's actually going on here? Actually, this is where the seawater is coming in, and we need seawater to cool the steam once it's gone through the turbine back to water. The big wheels you see turning behind us, this is where we take out the rubbish and the fish out of the seawater because we need very clean water going through the turbine. Gordon. How much electricity does Sizewell B produce? Sizewell B produces 1,188 megawatts. <whistles> enough for my kettle. That is enough for one and a half million people. There are, of course, other ways of producing electricity. Many scientists believe that nuclear energy is not safe. They also say that coal and oil are making a hole in the ozone layer. They say that we need to use different forms of energy. One way to make electricity is to use the energy of the sun. Many countries now use solar power to produce electricity. Perhaps this is the energy source of the future. Rex isn't here. Maybe he's in the workshop. Yeah, come on, let's have a look. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Rex, what are you doing? 
doing? I'm making a light. You can't make a light with a gherkin. Can't I? You look. How did you do that? Well, it's the same as a sodium street light. The gherkin is pickled in salt, and the salt contains sodium, and when you pass a current through the gherkin, the sodium will glow. Rex, how do aeroplanes fly? Follow me, I'm going to show you. Well, the first thing you've got to do is to produce some lift. The lift is produced by the wing of the aircraft, and I can show you this with this ball bearing. So, what's happening? The pressure pushing it up is greater than pushing it down. Yes, not a bad answer. Why doesn't it fall off when it's at an angle? Well, the air passing over the top of the ball is actually at a lower pressure than the air underneath it. And the ball is actually flying then, just like an aeroplane. Another way to show lift is with a couple of pieces of paper. If you actually try to blow them apart, that actually pulls them together. <laughs> and if you get a single sheet of paper and just gently blow over the top, the moving air will create enough pressure to lift the paper, like this. It lifts, the same as an aircraft. But what makes an aeroplane go forward? Let's go and see. To get the air to pass over the wing, the propeller turns and pulls the aircraft forwards. The thrust has to counteract another force called drag. This is the resistance of the airframe against the air when it's passing through it. So you watch what happened when I actually start this. This was the smallest engine I could find, and that still produces enough thrust to pull me round. Any questions? How do you control an aeroplane? Follow me. Well, this has a, a microlite aeroplane. I built it myself. Now, what do you want to know about it? What are all the dials for? Well, that one is a vertical speed indicator, so you can tell if you're going up or down. And this one is the airspeed indicator, so you know how fast you're going. And this one is the altimeter, which tells you how high you're going. What does this do? Uh, now, that controls up and down and sideways. What's this for? This is the throttle which makes the engine go faster to turn the propeller faster to produce more thrust. Right then, who's first? Sarah! Sarah.